All right, so let's just get into the sermon. Uh, we're going to be talking about eternal security. Uh, I know I've preached on this before, but just uh, there's a lot of you that haven't, haven't sort of heard uh, this sermon. And also just a, as a refresher as well, because I, I, I think eternal security is just a, a, a great uh, doctrine that really exalts the love of God. And I'll explain as we sort of finish up in this sermon. But there's a few things I'm going to go through. But mainly what I'm going to be talking about today is just five ways to explain ex e eternal security when we go out soul winning, when people think that they can lose their salvation or they believe they have to keep their salvation. These are five ways I think are very effective to be able to explain to somebody, to help them to understand why we can't lose uh, our salvation. So um, that's just on my document there. So what do I mean by eternal security? Eternal security means that once you are saved, you're always saved. So that's what we say in our movement, right? Once saved, always saved. Once you have salvation, once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved, there is no way to ever lose that salvation. You are eternally secure. You will never, ever go to hell once a person believes on Jesus Christ. Once saved, always saved. Now, this is a really good test when we go out soul winning, right? Because uh, when you go out soul winning, you talk to people, a lot of people will say, you know, I believe on Jesus, you know, and, and you know, Catholics will tell you that as well. A lot of people say they believe in Jesus, but it depends what they mean by that, right? What do they mean by they believe on Jesus? Or they say, oh, you know, they follow Jesus, or whatever. You know, they'll tell you something and you think, you know, is this person actually saved? So asking them about eternal security is a great way to test whether or not they are truly saved when you go out soul winning because and there's two good reasons why even if the person is saved that i talk about eternal security with them because number one we want to find out you know are they only trusting christ for salvation so if somebody says they believe on jesus christ but they believe that they can lose their salvation it sort of shows you where they're not really trusting jesus christ alone because they it shows that, that there's still something that's dependent on them because they can somehow mess it up they can somehow lose it but even if somebody is saved right because there are people obviously when somebody believes that they can lose their salvation they can sit in two categories right they can be somebody that is saved and they're just deceived or they're misled into believing they can lose their sal salvation and then they've just taken on a heresy or they're somebody that's actually not saved, right? They're actually not saved, they're trusting works, and then they're thinking they need to keep their salvation and work on it. Even though they believed on Jesus Christ, they need to keep working in order to stay saved. So two reasons. One is, are they only trusting Christ for their salvation? But even if I feel, okay, this person may have just been misled or they're a bit confused about salvation, but I believe they're actually asked, they actually are saved, I'll still talk about eternal security with them because I want to give them stability to their faith. Because if a person knows that they're saved eternally, they can't lose their salvation, they know for sure they're going to heaven, they're going to be a more effective witness for God, right? Because if you are concerned whether or not you are even going to make it to heaven when you die, I mean, you're not going to be a very effective witness if, if you don't even know that yourself. When you're trying to give somebody else assurance, you're trying to explain to them how hey, you can know for sure you're going to heaven, but you in the back of your mind is, am I going to make it? Am I going to finish my race? You know, like a lot of people think, you know, am I going to do, endure to the end to be saved? So I'll still talk about, st talk about it with them out soul winning, even though I believe they're saved just to, to make sure, and even if I do think they are saved, to give them some stability, some assurance so that they know that they're saved and then they can work on growing in the faith as opposed to continue, continuing to, to work for salvation. Now in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, it says here, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father which has loved us and hath given us, look at this, everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. See, so it's not only eternal salvation, but we get everlasting consolation as well, that comfort, right? That assurance that we know we're going to get to heaven. We don't wonder, you know, after we believed on Jesus Christ, are we going to make it still? No, we have everlasting consolation, this comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So you see how we get settled, we get established when we have this assurance, we have this sure anchor when we know that we're saved, when we're once saved, we're always saved. So here are five ways to explain, ex ex explain eternal security when you're out soul winning. If people are finding it hard to understand, how, how can I just be saved and just always be saved? How does that even make sense? Um, here are five ways you can explain it. 
uh, from the scriptures. So the first one is, is just, just the plain definition of eternal and everlasting, right? There's plenty of verses in the Bible that talk about eternal life, everlasting life. And you can just say, well, what, what does eternal and everlasting mean? You know, um, if you look it up in dictionary.com, it's funny how they actually cross-reference each other, these two words. If you look up the word eternal, it says lasting forever. Um, and if you look up the word everlasting, it says lasting forever, and then it says comma eternal, right? So they're almost, they're, they're synonymous words. I know uh, probably the, the root words, if, if we've all sort of learned this before, like to, to terminate eternal means it never ends, and everlasting means to last forever. I know Kevin explains it that way. It's kind of like two ways of looking at the same concept, right? It's eternal. One is looking from an end point, and one is looking from a beginning and that it goes on forever. But really, these words are synonymous, and that's why the Bible just uses them interchangeably, right? Eternal, everlasting. These are just two synonymous words that mean the same thing. So just the plain definition, you can go to passages like John 6, 47. You know, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So hath is present tense. You have it right now. It's not something you get in the future. The moment you believe on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. And, and that's the definition of it. You just to say them. What does everlasting mean? It lasts forever. So can you lose something? Can, can something end that lasts forever? Of course not, right? It's everlasting. Uh, John 5, 24, he says here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, so that's the faith on Jesus Christ, hath everlasting life. So that's the present tense. That's what you get the moment you believe. And shall not come into condemnation. So that's looking into the future. You will not come into any condemnation into the future because you have everlasting life. Why? But is passed from death unto life. So you see that past, present, future there. In the past, you've passed from death unto life, but now you have everlasting life and you shall not come into condemnation. Romans 6.23, this is one that we use when we actually go out sowing, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's an analogy? So you're saved and you have eternal life, right? You might explain to somebody, well, if you have everlasting life today, you're saved today, but for whatever reason you commit a sin and you lose it in one year. How long did it last? And they'll say, well, it lasted one year. And you ask them, well, is that eternal? That's not eternal, is it? So if you can lose salvation, it didn't last forever. It's not eternal, um, just by the plain definition of it. So if you only have eternal life for one year, that's not eternal life, right? You know, are you saved or are you not? You know, have you passed from death unto life or have you not? And how can you be saved from hell but still have the possibility of going to hell? Well, obviously, you're not saved from the punishment if you can still go there. So we have everlasting life. Just the plain definition of eternal life, everlasting life all throughout the Bible shows us that we have everlasting life. It's eternal. If we could lose it even after 20 years, after 30 years, that's not eternal. So that's one way you can explain eternal life, right? Just the word eternal, everlasting itself, and its plain definition. Um, if they don't accept that, then you can go on to other explanations. So the second explanation you can say is, well, salvation is not by works, right? We know that salvation is not by works, it's by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, I've had people tell me that these works, like they'll say to you, like the Catholics and the Orthodox, they'll say to you, oh, you know, it's not of works, but the works that it's talking about is like the old Mosaic law works, not just like the new works in the New Testament. But it's like, no, 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 the, the works in the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, it included good works as well. Remember how Jesus said, you know, you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. So it's not like there, obviously there are the carnal ordinances and there are the works that the priests did. But when we talk about the works of the law, if you read in Galatians, the works of the law included good works as well. It included just, you know, you know loving God, you know, don't lie, don't steal, um, the Ten Commandments. That, that's included in the works of the law. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work. So these two verses are just great, plain verses that say in the Bible, hey, we 
We do not work our way to heaven. We do not do anything to merit our salvation. We're not working for eternal life. No, we are saved by grace through faith and we have imputed righteousness unto us without works, right? Now think about this in terms, in terms of eternal life, in terms of once saved, always saved. What's, what's, what's so funny about like being able to lose your salvation is if you could lose your salvation, that means you can somehow do something or be bad enough to no longer have salvation. But think about this. You never, you never earned salvation to begin with. Do you know what I mean? Like if I didn't work for my salvation, if I didn't do any works in order to earn salvation, why would a lack of works make me lose salvation? The works never had anything to do with salvation to begin with. So it's like... If somebody thinks, well, you know, you can, you can do something to make you bad enough to lose salvation. But I was never good enough to earn it to begin with, right? So how can I be good enough? I wasn't good enough to earn salvation. How can I be bad enough to lose it, right? So these are ways you can think about this. That, that's why, that's why salvation, this is why eternal security, once saved, always saved, it's inherent in the gospel, right? Because if I'm saved by grace through faith, if I'm not saved by works, then I can't lose it by not doing works because I wasn't good enough to get eternal life. How can, I, how can I be bad enough to lose it, right? It just doesn't make sense at all, right? Jude 1.1 says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So you see, we don't preserve our own salvation. We don't preserve our own eternal life. We are preserved in Jesus Christ and called and then you read at the end of jude now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy so you see how like we don't keep ourselves from falling we're not presenting ourselves faultless it's god that keeps us from falling it's god that's going to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever Amen. So that's another way you can think of it, right? Salvation is not by works. I didn't earn salvation by works. I can't lose salvation by not doing good works. I wasn't good enough to get salvation. I can't be bad enough to lose salvation. It just doesn't make sense. How, do, how, how can I be bad enough to lose something that I never deserved in the first place, right? So that's number two. Number three is Jesus died for all sins, right? He died for all sins, past, present, and future and as we go through these you can see how this is just it's an inherent truth in the gospel um you know it says here in first timothy 4 10 for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living god who is the savior of all men especially of those that believe so it means he's god is the savior of everybody because he's died for everybody's sins past present and future it's just it doesn't do you any good if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's especially of those that believe. Isaiah 53. This was a verse I was thinking of putting in the track, but you know, it just, it just, it just didn't win out. I know Michael gave me a really great verse as well, and that was a, a like contender to get put in the track, but then I could only fit two verses on each sort of panel, so I had to just choose the two that I thought were best. But I, I, one of my first drafts had this passage in it, because this is a great passage that just explains that as well. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of god and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all right so that's everybody's sins and this is why it's past present and future my little children these things write I unto you that ye sin not. So he doesn't, obviously God doesn't want us to sin, right? So we, we're not, we don't, we, we're not, we're not, when we believe once saved, always saved, when we believe we're eternally secure, we're not saying it's okay to sin, right? But he's saying that he doesn't want us to sin, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, so even if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation. So what does the word propitiation mean? If you look it up in the dictionary, basically it's a word that means it's, it's appeasing wrath, right? Because God has wrath towards sin and Jesus is the propitiation for our sin because he satisfies that wrath in our place, right? He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole 
world, right? So eternal security, it's inherently connected to the gospel, right? Because the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what sins did he die for, right? If he's dying for our sins, did he die for just some of them or did he die for all of them? Did he die for just the sins in the past, which is what some people believe. Some people believe when you believe on Jesus Christ, yeah, all your sins in the past are forgiven, but you have to constantly you know, be, be asking for forgiveness like the Catholics, right? You confess your sins week after week after week so that you're cleansed of these sins um, and you're constantly being forgiven of them and cleaning them. No, when Jesus Christ died for our sins, he died for all our sins. And one way I usually explain it out soul winning when people don't understand how all our sins can, uh, you know, all our future sins, like they might believe all our sins in the past have been forgiven through Jesus Christ, but all our sins in the future, you know what I ask them? I ask them, well, when did Jesus Christ die? When did he pay for all the sins, right? When did he actually fulfill the prophecy and die and rise again? Well, he died 2,000 years ago, right? So if he died 2,000 years ago for everyone's sins, all my sins were in the future, right? So it's not just the sins in the future for me, but when Jesus Christ paid for them, even my past sins were in the future and he died for all those sins. So all our sins were in the future. He didn't only die for my sins in the past. And look at this. There isn't a sin you will commit that hasn't already been paid for. See, this is why we have everlasting life. Because Jesus Christ died for all our sins, past, present, and future, there isn't a sin that I can commit that hasn't been paid for, right? Because if I'm going to lose my salvation somehow, don't I have to do something in order to lose salvation? But whatever I have to do, I'm not going to lose salvation by doing something good, right? I'm going to lose salvation by doing something wrong. I'm going to lose salvation by doing a sin. But Jesus Christ has paid for all my sins in the future. So I can't lose my salvation by committing a sin when that sin is already paid for, right? When I believed on Jesus Christ. Now this is something really cool because see, Jesus knew every sin you would commit when he went to the cross, right? Because he's God. And that's something really interesting because, and I've written here, and I know you guys are following along in the notes here, but see, because you, be, you may be surprised by the sin, but Jesus isn't. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, right? You do something that you, you are absolutely disgusted by. You, you do something, you know, maybe it's drugs or fornication or whatever, right? And you are just, I cannot believe I've done this. Surely I am not saved anymore. Surely I, you know, I, I, I whatever, if, if there's anything that could do to make me lose salvation, it's this. And you are absolutely disgusted by it. You are shocked by it. But do you know what? When Jesus went to the cross, he already knew that that was going to happen, right? He knows, from part, he knows from beginning to end all the sins you will ever commit, you, you have committed, you will commit, you're going to commit, and when he died on the cross, he died for all those sins. He saw all those sins in the future and he's paid for them, right? So you may be surprised by a sin that you could com commit, but Jesus isn't surprised, right? He already knew about it, right? When he died on the cross. And this is why we know we have eternal life because there's no sin, even a sin that you don't know that you're going to commit yet. It's already been paid for if you've believed on Jesus Christ. Obviously, the condition is that you believe on Jesus Christ. If you haven't believed on Jesus Christ, then obviously all you still have the punishment of sin and the wrath of God abiding on you. What's another one? So what have what we talked about so far, right? So uh, Jesus, uh, I'm just trying to remind myself now. So Jesus uh, um, has paid for all our sins. Uh, it's not by works and the plain definition of eternal life, right? Number four. Number four is this analogy that once you are born into a family, once you are a son, you are always a son. This is a way you can help people to understand eternal life, right? Once somebody is born into a family and they are a child of that person, even if they're a disobedient child, they're still a child, right? And this concept of being born again is an analogy that even Jesus uses in, re in regards to salvation. This is why it's a, it's a great analogy because it's one that Jesus uses. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being saved, believing on Jesus Christ, is likened to a birth, right? And this is why we can say that salvation happens in a moment. Salva salvation is an event that happens. It's not a process. You're not just being born for the rest of your life, right? You're born, and that's the start of your life, right? You start your life, and now you grow as a child of God. But it's not that you're just being born week after week after week and just constantly working on your birth, you know, when you're 50 years old. No, you, when you're born again, you're saved. 
Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And this is where we understand when people believe you have to be baptized to be saved and they try and go to John 3. We can see easily from the context of this passage that even Nicodemus is thinking about a second physical birth, right? He's not talking about going underwater or anything like that. That's what he's confused about. How can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he's thinking, Am I, I'm born once by the flesh and I'm going to be born second time by the flesh. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, right? So what is this water birth referring to? Well, we'll read on, and of the spirit. So the second birth being born again is not a physical fleshly birth. It's a spiritual birth by believing on Jesus Christ. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So I've underlined flesh is flesh because you can see it lines up with being born of water. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you can see the water birth that, he, that Jesus uh, is referring to is not being baptized by water. It's referring to our first physical birth where we break you know, our mother's waters and we come out of the womb. Except the man be born of water, so that's the flesh birth, and of the spirit that's being born of the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So what I believe that's referring to is when somebody's born, somebody is born again, they'll, they'll, they'll have a testimony, right, that they're born again, that they'll say they believe on Jesus Christ. This is how we know somebody's spirit, right, by the words that they speak. And this is how we know the Spirit of God, because of the Word of God. They're just like inter, interlinked. You see throughout the Bible, right? We're born of the Spirit, we're born of the Word. You know, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. And that's what Jesus is saying here in John 3.8. He's saying, like somebody that's born of the Spirit, you don't see anything particular, right? You don't you know, you see this change of life, right? That people say, this change of life. See that they've repented of all their sins or whatever. No, no, we don't see that because that's not what it takes to be saved. It's not by works. What we do see, or what we do hear, we hear the Spirit. That's, that's how we can kind of judge how somebody's saved or not, by what they are saying, right? Because we're seeing their faith by the words that they speak. And what Jesus is saying here, the wind, you can hear the wind, but you can't see the wind. And the same with somebody who's born again. You can't see their Spirit, but you can hear their Spirit by the things that they're saying. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So we see this concept of being born again, because we, when we believe on Jesus Christ, we become a son of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were not born, not, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right? So it's not a physical fleshly birth, right? It's not from people sleeping together and, and having a baby, right? It's, it's of God, right? It's a spiritual birth. I just want to show you that there's the three here. He's born of the Spirit, born of God in John 1. And then we see here, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So isn't it interesting here that all three parts of the Trinity are taking part here in salvation, right? Born of the Spirit, born of God, born by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I'd, I'd actually check that verse in a couple of different like, places, like in, in you know, King James, right? Because I just felt like it, it just said it wrong. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It just seems to make more sense to me that it would say, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you, but... I don't know why it says which pie. I thought, is this an error like in Sword Searcher? But I, had to, I checked a couple of others, but it is which pie. I don't know why it sounds, sounds funny. But hey, I'm not going to say my English is better than these guys. Uh, so, you know, once, so a way you can think about this, right? So once you're a son, you're always a son. You can say, hey, once you're born, you can't be unborn, right? You know, even if, my, even if my son, you know, he's like disobedient, he grows up, he's a bank robber, he's a murderer doesn't matter he, he's always my son that's how we can think of eternal security explain it to somebody right once you're a child of somebody it doesn't matter what you do you are always a child even if you're a disobedient child you know once you're born you cannot be unborn you know you can die 
But Jesus promises we will never perish, right? We'll never die once we're saved, right? John eleven twenty one. 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So remember, they thought that Lazarus had died, and he had physically, but not spiritually, because Jesus, at the beginning of John 11, he says he's going to go to wake um, Lazarus. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So you see, once we believe on Jesus Christ, we will never die. Right? So if we end up dying, going to hell, that's, uh, that's, that's Jesus is lying there. But Jesus can't, can't lie. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. John 10, 28. This is a really familiar one to us. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So this is interesting. When Jesus says in John 28, you're in my hand. Then in John 10, 29, hey, you're in the Father's hand. And then in John 10, 30, he says, hey, I and my Father are one, because it's the same hand, right? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So are there two different hands? Well, this is not what the Jews understood, right? Jesus answered them, Many good works which I have showed you from my Father, for which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So you see, like they, they understood what Jesus was talking about when he said, I and my Father are one, you're in my hand, you're in the Father's hand, it's the same hand. They're like, hey, you're making yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now I'm just going to this point in the scripture. It doesn't really have anything to do with the sermon, but I just thought this was an interesting side note that um, where Jesus, you know, often, and you know, now that we're going into Lakemba, I want you guys to understand this concept because... Um, Obviously, Muslims don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And yes, you know, we can say that Jesus is never quoted in the Bible as saying, I am God, worship me, right? Like as Zachar Naik says. But, you know, that's not even our position. But if a Muslim says to you, where, did Je where is it quoted where Jesus says he's the Son of God? There are two places in the Bible where Jesus plainly says, I am the Son of God. And this is one of them in John 10, 36, where he says, Thou, you know, are you saying to me I'm blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? right so th this is something you can show them from the bible if they say or oh, where does jesus ever say you know i am the son of god in the scriptures this is one place you can take them but see, it's not only that i mean for, to, to, to not deny that jesus christ is the son of god is not just denying what he's plainly said in john 10 and in another location but even if you remember we read in john 11 you know you even have um you know martha here saying uh where did we go she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. So, so why didn't Jesus correct her? You know, you have Peter saying, Hey, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why is Jesus not correcting his disciples? Why is he saying, no, 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 you don't understand, guys. Like, you know, Allah you know, doesn't have a son, right? I'm not, this, I'm just a prophet. No, but every time they, they testified and said, Hey, you are the Son of God, Jesus confirmed that. Right? So it's not just Jesus' testimony, it's all the testimonies of all the writers. And the fact that John as well is writing this, and Luke is writing other passages as well, uh, where we see that Jesus is the Son of God, we see these multiple witnesses testifying to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, just one point here before I go on to just Jesus being the only begotten son. Is marriage is not the best analogy for eternal security, right? Just due to the fact that fornication is a way where a marriage can be nullified, right? So I don't usually use, like when I, when I explain eternal security to people out soul winning, I don't usually use the analogy of marriage because marriages can end, right? Marriages, you know, um, if somebody commits fornication, a marriage can end. But if a son commits fornication, he's still a son. Right? So it's a better analogy, and it's the analogy that, that God uses. Right? 
being born again. Now, in John 3.16, the reason why I'm here is because the Bible says that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Because when you talk to Muslims, even if there are Muslims out there that accept that Jesus is the Son of God, they'll just say, well, what's the big deal, right? Because Adam was the Son of God. Right? So this is why I want you to understand, what's, what's, what's special about Jesus being the only begotten Son? Right? So Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is just a side note. This has nothing to do with eternal security. But John 3.16, we read that already, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now I want to show you this in the NIV. The NIV has this translated wrong, right? Because the NIV, if you read John 3.16 in the NIV, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I have a problem with all the other words, right? Because they're all the same. Like whoever is the same as whosoever, believes is the same as believeth, eternal life is the same as everlasting life. But only begotten son is very different to one and only son. Why? Because Jesus Christ is not the own, one and only son of God, right? Because we are sons of God. We already read that before. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So it's wrong to say that God gave his one and only son because God has many sons, right? But what's special about Jesus' sonship, right? He's the only begotten son. Now, what does that mean? Let's, let's, let, me, let me explain this. Because one thing is they'll say, see, we don't believe Jesus is the son of God. And when you talk to Muslims, they'll pull this one up on you, right? Because this is an argument that Zach and Ike uses. But basically they'll say, oh, you, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God just because he doesn't have a mother and father? Because some people argue it that way. That's not why, you know, at the end of the day, we believe he's the son of God because we believe the Bible is the word of God and the Bible says he's the son of God. At the, uh, at the end of the day, that's the fundamental argument, right? But a lot of Christians will say, some Christians will say, well, he's, he's the son of God because he didn't have a father. He didn't have an earthly father, right? So then God's his father. But then what they'll say to that, the, the argument that Muslims will say to that argument is, well, Adam didn't have a mother and didn't have a father. That's why he's the son of God too, right? So what's so special about Jesus? He didn't have a mother and a father, you know, mother and a father. Adam didn't have a mother and a father. So, you know, is he just on par with Adam? But the thing is, see, Adam is referred to as the son of God, Luke 3, 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth. This is the genealogy in Luke 3, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So you see how it's not right to refer to, to say that God gave his one and only son because he has multiple sons. Adam is the son of God, right? Jesus is the son of God, but Jesus is the only begotten son of God. We are also sons of God, right? John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to explain to you is, what does it mean by the only begotten Son of God? Because this is going to confuse you now, because we are also begotten sons of God, right? James 1.17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So remember being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. We are actually begotten of God, and that's why we are sons of God, because he, we, are begot, we are begotten sons through the word of God. Um, now, what did I want to show? Okay, I don't want to go into this. So, so what's the difference, right? So, so we have Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God. He's not the one and only son, right? Because Adam is the son of God. We are sons of God. He's not even the only begotten son of God in a sense because we are begotten sons of God through the word. But what makes Jesus being begotten of God different to us being begotten of God? It's because Jesus was the only begotten son of God in the flesh. That's the difference. All right. So when the Bible says he gave his only begotten son, it's because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word that was made flesh was begotten of the Holy Spirit, as opposed to us. What are we? When we are born again, 
right? We're born again by the word in the spirit, right? So we are begotten sons of God spiritually, right? But we, but we are not begotten sons of God physically, right? Uh, and even Adam wasn't begotten of God. He wasn't born. He was created, right? So he's a created son of God. So if God creates something directly, they're a son of God. That's why Adam is a son of God because he was created by God. And then we are born through the line of Adam. We are like sons of Adam, right? In the sense that we descended from Adam. So our flesh is not a son of God. But when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now called sons of God because our spirit is born again. Our spirit is begotten through the word and we are begotten sons of God. Now, what about our body, right? Does our body one day become a begotten son of God? No, right? Because remember how we are sons of God spiritually because we're begotten of God through the word of God. But physically, we are adopted, right? We are adopted sons. We're not begotten physically. So Jesus is different. He's the only begotten son of God because he's the only physical one born of God. But spiritually, we're born of God. Physically, one day we will be adopted by God right and this is what the resurrection is the resurrection when we're given our new bodies is that adoption romans 8 23 and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the spirit so that's the spirit that's born of god right but when we believe on jesus christ even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body right so we're not adopted children yet one day we will, we will be adopted because right now we are begotten sons of god spiritually in our non-begotten flesh right sons of Adam in this fleshly flesh but thank god like we read in john 1 right first john uh, from first john that we can call we are treated as sons even though we're not fully sons of god right we've got the flesh and we've got the spirit but now we call the sons of god thank god that we are treated as sons even though we're not fully sons but we're waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies so when we are transformed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye that is the adopt that's when we are adopted into god's family the physical um uh, i guess it's i don't think it's flesh it's, it'd be something else i don't know what it is uh, when we get a new body luke 1 30 so this is the this is um the the passage of when the the, the uh, angel comes to mary uh, and announces Jesus' birth the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Right? So not only, you know, Martha, Peter, you know, Luke is writing this, John's writing the Gospel of John, but even the angel Gabriel is testifying that Jesus is the Son of God, right? So Muslims have a pretty hard case to... You know, there's a lot of witnesses saying that Jesus is the Son of God. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Right? So this is why Jesus, as a man, is referred to the Son of God, because he was born of the Holy Ghost. But physically, right, the actual flesh was born of God, right? as opposed to born of, this, you know, born of uh, his spirit, right? like us. We're born of the spirit, but physically we're, we've got a father. And this is, even, this is even alluded to in John 1.14. See, look, and the word was made flesh right, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we didn't behold the Spirit, right? We beheld the flesh. And we beheld the flesh that was the only begotten of God, right? So, it's, so that's why, that's what makes Jesus different. I hope you guys sort of get that. So, because you might sort of get thrown off and say like, well, he's not the one and only Son. Because we, so what makes him so special about being a Son of God? Well, he's not even the only begotten son of God because, you know, we're begotten of God and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's like, well, what's, what's the difference? So you don't want to be thrown off. He's, the reason why he's special is because physically he's the only begotten son of God, right? And that's why, that's why he's special. That's why he's different. And that's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Last one is God has promised eternal life and he cannot lie. Right, so we've gone through four reasons already. The last reason I've got for you is number five. God has promised eternal life 
and he cannot lie. So this is kind of, this is kind of intertwined with the definition of eternal life because if, if eternal life means forever, it means everlasting. And God is saying you have everlasting life. I mean, God's not a liar, right? And if, you, and if, if, you, if he says you have everlasting life and you don't have everlasting life, then he's lying or everlasting life means something else that it doesn't. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. See, this is how we can know we have eternal life because it's not that I can give you eternal life in a box. I can't just say, hey, here's eternal life. You have it. Give it to you. No, you know you have eternal life because it's a promise of God that if you believe, you know you believe. If you believe, you have everlasting life and God doesn't lie, right? So that's why, you know, I can lie to you. I can say something to you and it's not true, but God cannot lie. And that's why when God says you have eternal life, that's as good as as well, it's, you know, it's better than anything in this world, right? Because everything in this world is temporary. And this is the promise. This is, I, I love how this, it says this in 1 John 2. It's like, you know, how much clearer can it say that he's promising? And this is the promise that he hath promised us, <laughs> even eternal life. John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Right? So if Jesus can't lie, if you were to perish for any reason, if you're saved and you're not always saved, if you perish, then Jesus is a liar and Jesus cannot lie. So this is how we know we have eternal life. Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? And what's great about this passage is, you know, Jesus says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Because oftentimes we... Can forsake Jesus, right? The disciples forsook Jesus, right? We can walk away from Jesus. But Jesus is not saying, you'll never leave me nor forsake me. He says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Because you may walk away from Jesus. You may forsake Jesus, but Jesus will never forsake you, right? And the illustration I try and give people is I say, like, it's like when you have a child, right? You're holding the child's hand, right? And you say to the child, you know, I'll never leave thee, you know, I'll never let go. The child may try and get away from you, right? What happens when, when you're holding onto a child's hand and the child tries to get away from you? What do you do? You grip harder, don't you? And that's what God is like, right? You try and get away from God. You can try as, as much as you like to get away from God, right? He's not going to let you go, right? You're in his hand. Remember, you'll never perish. Neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. He's not even going to let you take yourself out of his hand. And that's why I like to think of it. You know, we are in his hand. We're a child of God. If we try and get away from God, God's just going to hold tighter. So we may forsake him, but he won't forsake us. Uh, 1 John 5, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God, see, look at this, hath made him a liar. Why? Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So he said, God's given a record of his Son. If you don't believe it, you're making him a liar. Why? Because God can't lie. You have to believe it. If you don't believe it, the only other option is that you think God is lying. And this is the record. What's the record? That God hath given to us eternal life. Hath, present tense, right? He's given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So you see this tie-in with believing the record, God can't lie. If you don't believe it, you're making him a liar. Then in John 5.13, this is our assurance of our salvation, right? These things, I've written these things that you may, uh, written unto you that you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So you see the record is you have been given eternal life, and because of that, he's like, I'm writing these things to you that, so that you know you have eternal life, you have that assurance that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Here's a couple of questions. Can you genuinely know you are saved? If you don't know, you will not lose salvation. Right? Like if the Bible says you know you have eternal life, can you really know you have eternal life if you don't know you will have eternal life? Right? Like if you can lose eternal life. You can lose your salvation. How can you have that assurance of your salvation if you can lose it? Um, and, you know, you're assured of eternal life. You know you have eternal life. It's not that you know you have temporary life, right? And, the, and I said it's present tense. You're assured now, not later. So it's not that you'll get it when you die, like a lot of Pentecostals believe. They believe, oh, you know, you can throw it away because you haven't actually got eternal life yet. You get it when you die. No, no, you have it now. You're assured of it now. You're not assured of it later. 
Somebody might ask, well, what if I stop believing? Right? 2 Timothy 2.13, because we receive salvation by faith, well, people say, well, what if I stop believing? Am I still saved? Right? The Bible says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Right? Because God cannot lie, God has promised you everlasting life. If you believe on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. If you ever lose eternal life, God would be a liar. That's why he's saying he can't deny himself. He can't deny his own promise, his own word, when he's promised you everlasting life. So if you stop believing, hypothetically, you're still saved, right? Because you have everlasting life. Now the question is, how many times do you need to believe to be born again, right? So some people get confused here because they say, you know, I need to believe to receive eternal life, so am I only saved when I still believe? What if I don't believe? Because salvation is by faith. If I don't have faith anymore, am I still saved? And the way I explain this is, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, right? It's, it's, it, faith is the avenue by which we receive this grace, right? It's kind of like, the, if you can imagine, it's like the conduit or the, the means by which grace is offered to us. And then we have faith to receive that grace and through that sort of tunnel or whatever means, we now have that grace and we're saved, right? So what I explain to people is that salvation, the faith in order to be saved, it's, it's not a state of faith, right? It's not the, it's not the state of your faith. Do you, mean, do you, know, you know what I mean by the state of your faith? Like whether you believe or not at this very moment, right? But salvation is the moment you have that faith to receive that grace, you're saved, right? So it's a moment of belief. It's not a state of belief. Why? Because as a, even as a believer, you have times when you have faith and you don't have faith, right? So if salvation was based on the state of your faith, you'd be losing it like every day, right? Because there'd be days where you have faith and days where you don't have faith. Salvation is not dependent on the state of your faith. It's dependent on that one time, right, where you're born again and you have called upon the Lord in faith and, by, and, and through faith you've received that grace. So it's a moment of belief. It's not the state of belief, right? So a moment of belief can save somebody, right? Because it's that moment that you receive that grace. But then you'll have moments where you don't have faith, right? doesn't mean you're not saved. So it's the moment. It requires a moment of faith, not your state of your faith. How do we know that? Because in Mark 9, look at this gentleman. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Right? Because there are, there are times in our life where we doubt God. We don't have the faith we ought to have. Does that mean we're not saved? No, no. Because it's, it's just whether or not you've received salvation one time in your life. Right? Because it's, salvation is eternal. You only need to get it once. You're saved forever. So that moment you receive eternal life, you're saved. But you have times when you have faith and you don't have faith. And that's why you need to understand that it's a moment of faith getting saved. It's not a state of faith. Getting saved and receiving eternal life. It's like a one-way street, right? Or like a one-way valve, you know? You, you, you blow up those air beds, right? And they have those one-way valves where you can, air can go in, but air can't come out. That's what salvation's like, you know? It's like your faith, it's like a one-way valve, right? It allows grace to come in, right? But then you, you can't lose your salvation once you've received that grace. That's how I like to think of it. Um, another example is like the ark. I don't know if you've ever realized this with Noah's ark. When Noah got onto the ark, look at what it says. It says, they went in unto Noah, they went in unto Noah, into the ark. This is the animals, right? Two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And look at this. And the Lord shut him in. So the ark is a picture of Jesus, right? The ark's a picture of salvation. They got onto the ark. They went through the door, Right? Of the ark and they were saved from God's wrath right the flood water but isn't it interesting that when the Bible says when they got onto the ark it said the Lord shut them in so it wasn't that they closed the door you know I, I don't know how it would have worked right but somehow the Bible says here they, that they were shut in maybe they closed the door and God sealed it right but that's what salvation's like salvation is it's it's once saved always saved because once you believe on Jesus Christ you have everlasting life God is shutting you in it's a one-way street once you get got on the ark you know, I wonder if that's how it worked with the ark. You know, once you got on the ark, you couldn't get off even if you wanted to because the, because the Lord shut you in. All right, this is just the last point I'll end on. Uh, just sort of some concluding thoughts. But, you know, I love the doctrine of eternal security because once you, once you understand 
the doctrine of eternal security, it really exalts the love of God. And, you know, really it kind of works two ways, right? Because people can take advantage of God's love, right? And they can say, well, if you know you're saved, what's stopping you from keeping on sinning? Well, really not, nothing is stopping you besides the punishment of God, you know, the chastisement of God, right? And the, the fact that God might take your life or something. But, you know, really nothing is stopping you because, you know, you know the, the more you sin, the more grace abounds, right? But... This is where, when you reflect on it, it really exalts the love of God because of the same truth, because of the fact that the more you sin, the more grace abounds. So it's, it's interesting that the same truth of eternal security, depending on how you look at it, and it really just comes down to a matter of the heart, right? Is if somebody realizes how sinful they are and they realize how much they've been forgiven, it's, it's, it's an amazing truth. But obviously, you know, the truth as well can be taken advantage of because that's grace that's eternal security because people will say things like this right people will say well you can't be saved and just live however you want and and a couple of things to think about is it's funny when people say this when people say things like that it, it's almost like you know it, do they say this as if they no longer sin you know people say this like well you can't just be saved and just live however you want as if they no longer sin because we all still sin right we all to a certain extent live however we want but yet we don't say that nobody's saved, right? Because people are saved. Even people that believe this way, they still think that people are saved. It's just that they, they set some arbitrary bar somewhere that they, you know, the, the, the amount that they live how they want is, is still permissible for them to be saved. But the, the way other people live how they want is not allowed, right? Because they're, they're not saved. But, you know, it's, and I think it's this, it's this love we experience by understanding eternal security that drives us to obey God, right? That's how, how it should work. But there, you know, it, you can see this two ways, right? Like, it depends what they mean by this. You can't be saved and just live how you want. You know, and obviously there's two ways you can think about that because they say, well, if you're saved, you shouldn't just do whatever you want. And of course, you know, because you ought to obey the commandments of God. It's not we're saying that, you know, now that you're saved, it's okay to sin. Sin is still sin. It just means, hey, even if you sin, you're still saved. And this is what Romans 5 and Romans 6 really teach us. So when people talk to me about this out soul winning or they talk to me about this or are you just saying it's okay to sin no 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 it's, we're not saying sin is okay we're just saying that if you sin you're still saved right because you, it's still covered under the blood and this is what romans 5 and 6 actually says it says moreover the law entered that the offense might abound so the knowledge of the law makes us understand sin how sinful we are but look but where sin abounded Right? What's to abound? It's to just keep going, right? And it keeps, keeps uh, overflowing, the sin. Grace did much more abound. So even though we continue to sin, grace continues to cover that sin, right? Because remember, Jesus Christ died for all sin. He died for all sin, past, present, and future. There's enough grace to cover any sin, even if your sin continues to abound. But so what we're saying is, hey, you can be saved if you live however you want you'll still be saved but we're not saying it's okay to continue to sin right it's not the right thing to do romans 6 1 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound right why because grace will abound if you continue in sin if you continue to sin grace will continue to abound and this is why the love of god is exalted when we understand that even though we continue to sin god still loves us it's an amazing thing. Is it something we should do? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? No. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So no, it's not an exhortation. It's not this, this sick way of thinking that, oh, I'm just going to sin because I'm going to exalt God's grace, right? No. It's just saying that God's grace covers your sin even though you continue to sin, but that's not how we should be living. Of course, we should not continue in sin that grace may abound now in luke 7 this is an interesting story where a woman comes in and sort of washes jesus's feet and we learn a really great lesson here it says and one of the pharisees desired him that he would eat with him and he went into the pharisee's house and sat down to meet and behold a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew that jesus sat at meat in the pharisee's house brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet begin behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he, knew, if he were a prophet, 
would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50, right? So if you can imagine, that's tenfold, right? 500 versus 50, ten times more. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Right? So he's saying there's two creditors. One owes 500 pence. One owes 50. So maybe in our day and age, you can think of it as like somebody owes $500,000 and somebody only owes $50,000. And the master forgives them both of their debt. Just says, hey, you don't have to pay me back. Who's going to love the master more? Right? And Simon says, well, well probably the one that was, was forgiven more. One, right? The one that didn't have to pay 500000 back as opposed to 50000 back. And Jesus says, that's right. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman, I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. Right? So the reason why this woman loved Jesus so much is because she realized how many sins she had been forgiven of. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Now one thing I think about this is, is Jesus saying this because Simon really had less sins than the harlot? I mean, we don't really know, right? He gave this example of two people where one is forgiven less than another. You know, is it that Simon was actually less sinful than this harlot? Maybe in man's eyes he was because he wasn't, you know, maybe this woman was a prostitute or whatever and people could really see, you know, the extent of her sin. But, you know, all of us have broken the greatest commandment, right? To love God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. So is it that he really had less sins? Or is it just that he had not come to realize the extent of his sin, right? And it's kind of like with us. Do any of us really believe that we only have a small amount of sins? And, you know, this is my closing thought. Maybe this is why, you know, we love God so little, right? We love God so little because we don't realize the extent of our sin. We don't realize what Jesus paid for, what God did for us. We don't have the gratitude, the natural gratitude that would come from that. Like that woman, she realized she was so sinful, right? And the natural response, right, was to when she realized the extent of her sin was to love God so much. So it's not that we don't have a lot of sins, right? The only difference between what's driving our love is that we don't realize really the extent of our sin. And this is what I mean by eternal security really exalts the love of God. Because when you really get honest with yourself, you realize how far you come short of the glory of God and how much you fail God day in and day out. And then you realize, man, like God still loves me. That's an amazing truth. That's an amazing thought. It's just, you know, that's, that's where I feel like in your heart, God's love is so exalted. You know, when, when you realize, you know what, God, I just come so short. I fail you so many times, but God, you still love me as much as the day I got saved. What, a, what an amazing thing. Even though I come so short of what God expects, he still loves me as much as ever. So a couple of closing thoughts here. You know, this is something funny. It's just, you know, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? it's like they say it's like, it's like when I was talking about you know there's a sin that you might do that shocks you that disgusts you but Jesus already knew about it right so it's not like he didn't pay for it he doesn't know about it you know, why would that make him love you any less he knew you were when he died for you he knew you were going to do it already right but we sin thinking oh man God doesn't love me anymore God doesn't want anything to do with me God already knew you were going to do it right and he's loved you with an everlasting love he died for you on the cross so this is why this is what's beautiful about eternal life, right? About eternal security. You know, there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more, but also there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. You know, praise God for that, that we we have that love. And unfortunately, you know, this is what people don't like. You know, people don't like the fact that God's love can be taken advantage of. You know, that's why people say, you know, well, you can't just be saved and live however you want. And then what do they do? They change the gospel, right? And I, and I understand their motivation, right? Their motivation is they want people to live for God. 
But you don't change the gospel to, to motivate people to live for God. You don't change the truth of the gospel and start preaching heresy, start preaching work salvation because you want people to live for God. No, you preach the truth, you, you get them to understand the truth, you exhort them to do right. You don't change the gospel just because you want people to live right. Because the truth is, even if people don't live right as saved believers, they're still saved, right? Because all their sins were washed under the blood when they got saved. This is the last verse I'll read, Romans 8.35. Beautiful passage. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What can separate us from the love of Christ? This is what this is saying, right? Is there anything? Then it lists a whole bunch of things. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So once we're saved, we are always saved. We have eternal security thank God for that. And I think when you realize what you've been forgiven of, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, throughout our life, you know, because we are constantly sinning, because we are constantly falling, I feel like if you understand this truth, the love of God in your heart will constantly be exalted when you realize, hey, even though I've come so short, I've failed God, he still loves me just as much as he did the day I was born again. All right, I hope that was a blessing to you. Let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Just thank you for the reminder that we are eternally saved. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this assurance. I pray, Lord, that there's this love that we experience through your promise, Lord, that would, it would constrain us and that we, it would drive us to, to, to serve you, to be that ambassador that you've called us to be. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand this truth, that now we have five ways that we can explain this and help people to understand. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand as well. That would be edifying to us. And, 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 and Lord, we thank you for that. So help us, Lord, uh, bless uh, the rest of our time here. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.